under 18. Here, under 25, stand up. Let's, let's give it up for everybody and get all the young people out here. Now, I did that, you gotta see, I did that for a reason because from this point, they're watching. So if you want to be lukewarm, that's what you want to pass down. But if you're gonna be excited, if you're gonna be fired up, what we heard earlier about 2020, about 2019, about every opportunity we have. I need you to act like it, and on top of that, I throw four hours down here, so I need y'all to be excited, okay? So, first and foremost, I want to I wanna have fun, but I also want to be very, very serious because we're in what Dr. King spoke about in 1963, which is the fierce urgency of now. And while it's great to commune with you, it's great to eat with people, you know it's great to be around family and fellow Democrats, we have to understand the time we're in and the critical opportunity that counties like Lowndes, there are 159 counties in the state of Georgia, and it's critical to understand that there are risks, there are challenges, and there are opportunities. If you don't remember anything else I say today, I want you to remember that there are risks, challenges, and opportunities. Now, I'm going to go into each of them. I'm only going to speak for about 15 minutes, but I want you to understand that there's a tremendous opportunity that we all have today. Another quote Dr. King said was, the true measure of man is not where he stands in times of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. And we live in a time in the United States and in the state of Georgia, understanding who occupies the White House, understanding when bills like the heartbeat bill are passed, understanding about how the attack on women right now, and, and if you're a man here, I don't expect to see women standing by themselves when the attack on women and policy and legislation is happening. We should be standing arm in arm with our women in Georgia and around this country. Yeah. So it's, it's extremely critical. It's extremely critical for us to understand that the time that we're in, it's, it, it takes some boldness and some courageousness, and it takes a little getting out of your comfort zone. I'm the son of the United States Army Ranger. If you're a veteran, way back in the way, thank you for your service. Let's give it up for our veterans. I, I, I grew up on Fort Bend, Georgia. Uh, my father was Special Forces. He's now buried in Canton, Georgia. Uh, and I want to thank you guys because, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard for people to understand, especially folks that live in the metro Atlanta region, to understand how important South Georgia is. It's very difficult for folks that are in positions of leadership. And I'm not criticizing our state party. I'm not criticizing anyone around our state. But when you've been raised in an area where your next door neighbor, their neighbor, folks down the street, folks around the corner, everybody you go to school with is progressive or a Democrat or things like you, it's easy to become comfortable and complacent in an area where you're not moved. And especially where I am, not only was I the first black person running for Side County, Georgia, I was the first Democrat to run there in 30 years. I want you all to understand something. I, well, I grew up, I grew up in, in Muskogee County, Georgia, in Columbus, Georgia. And when I left Columbus, it was to go to Clark Atlanta University. I met my wife in college. She went to Spelman College. And when I graduated, we, we decided that we wanted to make Atlanta our home. And as I got appointed to various boards and organizations within the Democratic Party, it made me extremely comfortable to the point that I began to accept mediocrity. I began to accept complacency because, again, when you're in a city where every elected official is a Democrat, it's real easy to kind of just put the car on cruise control. But one day I got invited to go a little further north, and I realized that folks in North Georgia, and I'm sorry for not acknowledging you earlier, um, um, Chairman and his wife, and I want to thank you all for inviting me here. But I, I want you all to understand that in 1987, a civil rights leader by the name of, of um, um, Hosea Williams led a march in Forsyth County, Georgia. It was a county that was mirrored in racial injustice. In 1912, the incident happened in Forsyth County, Georgia. There were 1,100 black folks that lived in Forsyth County, and in a span of three months, every single black person was forced out of that county. And according to record, not one black person lived up there again until 1987. Now, I want you all to understand something. I'm not saying that to you know make us feel bad or make us upset. I'm saying that because there are pockets around this state where Democrats have been left behind. There are pockets around this state where folks have forgotten that in areas like Lowndes County, Raven County, Lumpkin, Chapman, 
Arab areas that are not a part of the metro Atlanta region that, quite frankly, we left to fend for themselves. And when I ran for office in Forsyth County, I fundamentally understood that I wasn't going to win. I understood that, okay? It's not that I went into it because I wanted to lose, but I, I was, and excuse me for the way I'm going to say it, but I was going to be damned if it, not one Democrat was on the ballot. And, and we have to, as Democrats, We've got to start being intentional about running and doing things where we see there needs to be change. There's no, you know, I heard earlier the sister that was up here talking about retention and, and registration. But all those things are great, but it's not just for an election year. If we're not knocking on our neighbors' doors, if we're not recruiting candidates, if we're not speaking to these young people in high school to start Democratic chapters on their campuses, if we're not encouraging them to run for city council and school board, if it were up to me, both days would be taken down to 16 because if they can drive, they should be able to vote. And I think if we did a better job of getting young people involved early, we could no longer depend on schools to teach and encourage civics. So if we're not doing that and inspiring these young people early while they're in college and while they're in school, let me tell you what's going to happen. Our party is going to continue to get older and our party is going to get, begin to deteriorate because we're not going to be able to pass on those democratic values because we haven't left the blueprint in place. There's a gentleman in the White House right now by the name of Nick Ayers. Any of y'all know who Nick Ayers is? Nick Ayers was a political strategist when he was in his late teens. Nick Ayers ended up becoming a political strategist that went to Kennesaw State and ended up going to serve on several U.S. Senate uh, uh, campaigns for the Republican Party. And now Nick Ayers, at 22 years old, is the chief of staff to the Vice President of the United States. Now, why am I saying that? Because if, if, if Republicans are doing anything better than Democrats, it's recruiting people up to their party and building out a bench that we can pick from so that when we run statewide elections and when we run local elections, we have a pool of talent to pick from because you can't sit in here and tell me today that they're any smarter than us. You can't sit in here and tell me today that they make better policies than us. But what they are doing is they're out recruiting us. What they are doing is sticking to their guns and sticking, I don't mean guns in the sense of AR-15, I'm talking about they're sticking to what works for them on a consistent basis and they're not neglecting the county party system. And one thing we have to do, and I heard the chairman say this earlier, he said how he had three surrounding county chairs meet with them today. That's how you win in Georgia. When I was Bernie Sanders' political director, the one thing that I did that I had to focus on in the state of Georgia, and by the way, after Bernie Sanders didn't get the Democratic nomination, I rolled up my sleeves and I worked for Hillary Clinton. Why? Because our party is fractured enough and there's no way we win, there's no way we, we work together, there's no way we grow if we're a fractured party. You can't tell me that if you give me a cracked glass that you can fill it up with water and the water's going to stay in there. The only way we're able to continue to grow as a party is by building the kind of infrastructure we need by working together. That starts at the grassroots level, it starts at organizing in these local areas, and it starts in areas like Forsyth and Lowndes County where it looks like it's an uphill battle for Democrats, but that's okay. Because when I moved to Forsyth County, Georgia, there are about four people, four Democrats, in a funeral home owned by Republican meetings. <laughs> The fact that I said funeral home should just have just thrown y'all over the fact that it was a funeral home owned by Republicans was the only place that Democrats could organize outside of someone's living. But because we persisted, everybody say persisted. persisted. Because we stayed on track, we now have a membership of over 70 Democrats. Not only do I live in a county that every single seat was red, we just had a race in the 7th Congressional District last year where the Democrat came within 500 votes of a runoff. I now live in a district where we flipped three precincts. I now live in a district where an African American ran, a Democrat ran the first time. So what I'm saying to you all today is that when you persist, when you work hard, regardless of what it looks like in Dallas County right now, but regardless of what it looks like in Valdosta, when you persist, and when you work, and when we don't allow invite, inviting to fracture our party, we can make progress. There's a scripture, I don't know if you're religious or not, but there's a scripture in the Bible that regardless of what your faith is, it talks about a farmer going out to farm and planting wheat. And it says that tears were planted with the wheat. So instead of the good seed that he sowed in the ground growing up to make a good harvest, 
because there were weeds that were planted in the wheat. It showed all the good seed that was planted in. Now, what does that mean for the Democratic Party? For the last 20 years, every statewide constitutional office has been held by the public. For 20 years. Now, we came close last year. I think we could have done a little bit things differently, which, in my opinion, would be reaching out to places like Lowndes County and South Georgia and rural Georgia and coastal Georgia a lot earlier and not just in your service stops. And again, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. I just understand that the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And Democrats in this state, you know, have been doing a lot of the things the same way without looking inside of ourselves first and looking at our counties and figuring out what things are we doing the same that, that could be changed. And that's where the risk come in. What risk are we taking as a party to challenge the way we all are thinking? We can no longer be separated in our party by race and by religion and all these things because we understand now that it's fundamentally much bigger than us. Same way how we're losing young white men from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, 14% of black men in this state voted for Brian Kemp, and 17% of black men in the United States voted for Donald Trump. So we have to understand that there are areas within our party that we have to address if we're going to be able to build. I know it's the 4th of July celebration of independence, but part of independence is getting that person out of the White House. So we're going to dig in deep and make sure that we can do the right thing and allow there to be a true sense. setting ourselves apart and doing things differently and thinking differently and being willing to speak to folks that might not be comfortable with. I mean, if you think about where I live, I live in Trump country. And I have a picture on my wall at home of a, of a door I knocked on and, and while I, you know, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but I've got a picture on my wall in my house of a yard sign on Lake Lanier. Two houses had a Donald Trump sign and a Daniel Blackman sign. And I'm going to tell you why that happened. Because there are a lot of folks that think they're Republican. I don't know if y'all caught that. There are a lot of folks that think they're Republican. It's just that they've been so indoctrinated for so long that nobody has presented them something different for them to buy into. But I've knocked on doors on streets that had Confederate flags. I knocked on doors where I knew people weren't on the voter registration because I just needed them to know that there was an option on the ballot because where I live, Democrats were on the ballot. The Republican primary was the general election. So I'm challenging you all in saying taking risks and, being, and having taking challenges, being willing to go outside the norm. If you limit yourself to your community or your neighborhood or your school or your district, we're not going to grow as a party that way. There has to be a strategy that's intentional that includes our churches, our schools, our organizations, our grassroots leaders. We've got to bring everybody to the poll, and we can't be afraid and, and, and criticize and condemn young people for not voting if we're not willing to give them something to vote for. I know I wasn't going to get that many claps on that, but it's okay. <laughs> because, and I'm being very serious, it's easy to, to condemn young people for not being as active. I'm going to tell you something. Many of you all that are here, I don't mean this in a bad way, but many of you all were alive during the 60s. And you know that during the 60s, especially in 68, it, it wasn't popular to go chasing behind civil rights marches and movements. So don't act like they're doing anything different. It's just that this is a generation now that's more motivated by impulse. And on issues like human trafficking, the opioid crisis, criminal justice reform, those are single issues that motiv motivate them. Medicaid, Medicaid, I mean, uh, yeah, Medicaid, like, you know, health care, these are issues that are motivating them in their service. And instead of just expecting them to come into this beautiful place with, with many of you in this room, maybe it's time, and I don't know if you're already doing this, but maybe it's time for us to go to them. And for us to go to them with the intention of listening to understand and not to respond. Because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take us allowing some folks to say some things to us that's going to make us uncomfortable. To say some things to us that's going to make us a little upset. But if I know anything about history, and especially growing up in the South, it's never comfortable when change comes. And that's the part, that's one of the biggest challenges as Democrats that we're going to have to face. The growing pains that come along with change. Now I mentioned 
being in Forsyth County, Georgia. I, I understand being in that county and how, how hard it was as a Democrat and the work that we had to do throughout that time. But I'll tell you, the growing pains were worth it to now see organizations and, and, and neighborhoods that would have never put a Democratic yard sign up because they would have to fight with their neighbor. They would have never made phone calls on behalf of the Democrats. They would have never organized the Democratic leaders. They would have never even thought of going to the Republican chair and saying, we want to have to pay. But because of the growing pains that went along with organizing in the county that was traditionally conservative, traditionally older and white, and I'm not saying that in a negative way, I'm just saying that was the Democrats we had. But Forsyth County had the largest and fastest growing Indian population in the United States. Forsyth County 30 years ago didn't have black folks there. Forsyth County 30 years ago didn't have Hispanics and us except the ones that came in and worked with chicken plants. But now we have all of those demographics that are going to school with our children, that are working with us, that are doing things, that, and it's a different county. And to me, the pain and the frustration of being in an area where it feels that nothing changes, it was worth it. It was worth putting in that time for four years. And I know people like Gretchen, and I know other folks that are here that you know I'm not going to start calling a bunch of names, so I'm going to get somebody. But I know how hard it is sometimes doing thankless work. But as a leader, sometimes you've got to share the credit and take all the blame. Until it, until it works itself out, you've got to pat people on the back, even though they might not deserve to be patted on the back. But if it, if, it, if it avoids an argument, if it avoids a voter registration drive, then just pat them on the back. Does that make sense? It's not worth it as Democrats to continue to argue over simple things when we've got folks, we've got 79 counties in the state of Georgia that don't have an OPGYN. We've got over 50 counties in the state of Georgia that are struggling because they don't have access to emergency services because they lack wireless broadband communication. We've got rural hospitals closing left and right. But we're arguing about local issues. So the challenges that we face are very real. But in my opinion, challenges lead to opportunities, which is my last point. Opportunities, many of you may have heard, or many of you may, may have heard this before, but it's, it's when, when preparation meets opportunity, that's when you get success, right? So I want to ask all of you today, don't answer the question. I want to ask all of you, how prepared do you really think you are? If Georgia was in place today, how prepared is Lyons County? If a presidential debate were to show up in Lowndes County tomorrow, how prepared are you as Democrats to organize and build those Because at the end of the day, we can argue and complain all we, all we want. But it's almost like, I remember, I'm going to use a basketball analogy, I remember when Kobe Bryant used to be on the bench. And when Kobe Bryant was on the bench, he played behind the guy. One day that guy got hurt. Kobe Bryant got in the game. Kobe Bryant never went back on the bench. Why I use that example? One, I felt like it. But two, on a serious note, because a lot of us around Georgia have been complaining. We've been saying, well, you know, what about South Georgia? What about North Georgia? What about, what about rural Georgia? What about coastal Georgia? And you are absolutely right. So be ready when the light is shining on Lyons County. That's the opportunity. Will you be ready when that door opens? Will you be ready when that election comes? guys have the opportunity to elect someone. I told this to Raven County the other day. Now, they didn't have anybody running for office in Raven County. So I asked them three questions. Is, is are all the 300 people here today ready to phone bank, knock on doors, and work on behalf of counties that have money, that have some money down? That's what you got to ask yourself. If somebody's not running in your district, what are you doing for the person that is running? If there's no one running in your area for Congress, then you better go to another county and find someone running for Congress and help them get elected. It's not about our county, it's about electing folks that's not going to make our, our that's not going to normalize foolishness. Because we've got a lot of folks elected right now that's making things that we would have never accepted. That are operating and legislating without any kind of integrity, but they're representing us, they're representing our ideas, and they're setting trends that our children will follow for the next 30 years. There's a tremendous opportunity for all of us here today to change the landscape of Georgia. Now, I don't mean this in a cliche type of way, but it starts right here in Lowndes County. What's the difference in Lowndes County and Muscogee County? What's the difference in Muscogee and Chatham? 
What's the difference in Chatham and Athens Clark County? What's the difference in all these counties? The only difference is that which county is going to operate and organize and help to move that needle. Democrats, we're coming close. We're, we're knocking at the door. We're doing a lot of good things. We're doing a lot of right, but we're not doing as well. I don't know about you. I don't like you. I don't like you. I'm serious. I, I do not like to lose at all. I mean, I, I told you earlier, I was raised by an Army Ranger. I, it, was, it was no plan in that house. It wasn't. My father, my father raised us on a quote that said, tough times don't last, tough people do. And we've seen the pain long enough of what defeat looks like. Communities get left behind. Areas that are highly populated with black people don't have any economic or social investment there. Eighty-eight percent of our prison population reaches the third grade level. Two point one million Georgia live out of below the poverty line. We don't have the luxury to take the time on the bail. We don't have the luxury to say I'm old and I'm tired. We don't have the luxury to say I'm poor and that's I'm young and that's not interesting. We've got to start stepping up and putting ourselves in a position where if, if, we're, if we're not on the ballot or we're not in a position to win, then we better be in a position to enact change. And I want to leave you guys with a quote before I take my seat. And, and any time that Frederick calls or y'all need me down here, I'm going to come. Just help me out with gas. <laughs> Dr. King once said, I'm, I'm using a lot of King-inspired quotes because I just I didn't believe in that time. I know there were a lot of great leaders that, that came before him and came after him, but he said a lot, and I want to leave you all with this. He said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. So I want you to leave this place today not just inspired, not just, you know, we ate some good food, and that's great, but I want you to wake up tomorrow with a mindset that from today until the day after November 6, 2020, or November 8, whatever the first Tuesday in, in 2020 is in November, I want you all to make up in your mind that you're going to commit yourselves today to changing the fundamental direction that this country has gone for the last three years and to make sure it starts not only in your state, but right here in your town. Thank you all so much. God bless you.